So, it has been five years now, ever since Fire Emblem Three Houses came out in a few days. I took a bit to make this video. And people are kind of saying the same things that they have been this whole time, but as someone who made a bunch of Fire Emblem content, I figured I'd just talk about this game since I've realized, yeah, I never actually did that on this channel. And it's been a long enough time, so it's like, what have my thoughts eventually settled on with the state of Fire Emblem Three Houses? And just giving a rambly, non-scripted type thing where I want to just open up some more discussion to it. And just what it means for the franchise now that it's been this long, the impact it has, and what I think it'll have going forward on the series. So, let's start with the beginning. I think the hype for Fire Emblem Three Houses was... It was weird, because at first they didn't really show enough to get people interested. I remember people were like, what is this Harry Potter-ass looking thing coming out here to Fire Emblem? Now that has a whole different connotation <laughs> with everything that's happened, but it didn't really do anything to excite me. And then Nintendo said, alright, we're not really getting much hype for this, let's just release it all. Let's just lay our cards bare, we kinda gotta show our final gambit. And then they revealed that there would be a time skip where everyone seems to be at each other's throats and you're like, what on earth is going on? And that got people excited. That's where everyone's like, alright, we gotta see where this is going. Because we live in an era where you kind of can't afford to keep the secret of a game without risking it going bad. This works for like movies because word of mouth is powerful, but I feel like word of mouth for games only really works for like indie titles, you know? For a $60 French for a $60 game in a major franchise, I feel like it's gonna be a lot harder to have word of mouth influence people. And so you just gotta make sure people know what they're getting into to be able to wanna just get in on the hype because early sales numbers do matter. Not that if this game did poorly, I think Fire Emblem would be in a bad position. But I think they really wanted this to do well, especially since it was relatively early in the Switch's lifespan, and the Switch, I mean, even to this day, is still producing great games seven years after its initial release. But early on, it was a bit of a... a bit harder than... a bit of a dry spell. It's not the juggernaut we know it as now. Granted, by that point, it had well established itself as a solid console for Nintendo's lineup. So, we just kind of lacked a good RPG at that point. Aside from Xenoblade, but that's only like one where RPGs can go in many different directions. And this is now, officially I guess, the best-selling strategy RPG of all time, according to this tweet. That probably makes sense because it's really just Fire Emblem pushing the genre forward with just how just successful it's been ever since Awakening. It's been over a decade since Awakening came up, revived the franchise, and this is the result. It's just kept on growing and growing ever since. Obviously, I think Fates beat Awakening's numbers, and then Echoes obviously didn't come close. It sold just under a million, like 800k roughly, if I remember right. So, to go from just a nice little experimental project that the devs clearly wanted to do, to just this juggernaut of a game that had just so much content packed in it, was incredibly welcoming to see just because we didn't know where Fire Emblem was going because for a while it just on handheld prior to Awakening it was on the 3D or the DS, Nintendo DS. We never got 12 released due to the poor sales of New Mystery on the DS but honestly that game probably would have done amazing here. Not amazing but I think it would have done much better just because of how just better the game is overall. For those who don't know, uh, the DS game is a remake of Marth's story and it wasn't really that good. It's one of the only Fire Emblem games I just said, no, I'm not finishing this on. And so, FE12 is just the same thing with a more concise story, and then expands with, like, what happens after the events of Marth's story. And it goes from there, and it just is, had better mechanics, better story-driven narrative. They introduced, like, a new thing. They had the first MC in the game with Chris. Uh, Robin wasn't the first, it was Chris, but we never got to experience that here in the West. And, I don't know, it would have been cool to have that here as a Fire Emblem fan, but I get why they didn't do it, because Japanese companies are scared of taking risks, and those lead to exciting things like Ace Attorney Investigations 2 finally coming out and getting localized in the year. Is it 2025 that's coming out? I think that's right, but not to get too sidetracked. Five years of Three Houses, and let me just say, I, as a Fire Emblem fan who was big into the series for like five years whenever Awakening came out, but going into this, 
wasn't that excited, and then after playing it, I was like, eh, well, okay. I made the mistake of being an Edelgard fan. Now, before y'all roast me, I have past videos saying I really like Edelgard. But Dimitri's kind of the goat, I'm just gonna say that. I feel like I'm one of, like, that 0.1% of people that like both Edelgard and Dimitri. I like Edelgard as a character from an antagonistic standpoint, and I love Dimitri as a protagonist. I think people who like Edelgard as a protagonist absolutely despise Dimitri. And then, I mean, with this meme on screen, it's just, this is how it's always been. Edelgard, Dimitri at each other's throats, and Claw's just chilling in the corner, living his best life. Golden Deer is still a really weird path, though. But yeah. So yeah, I was an Edelgard stan at the start. I played Black Eagles. And then after I beat Black Eagles, I was like, huh. This definitely feels phoned in. So I was like, alright, I'll keep going and play the Blue Lions path. And that was where I realized we had, I think, peak storytelling in Fire Emblem. I don't think there's a better story in Fire Emblem than the Blue Lions path. Dimitri's character arc and his growth is absolutely phenomenal. And the way the story presents the depiction of loss and grief is something that's so real. Considering I played this game in a very dark state in my own life, I really like seeing a character. Obviously, I didn't have to go out and murder people for a living, but just seeing someone go from set up to having success, because Dimitri was the crown prince. He just lost his mind after the events of the time skip, or what led up to the time skip transpired. And so, him having the lack of support necessary to just finally seeing the one person who could maybe fix him, just be like, huh, do I have a chance? And it's like, nope, he just goes off the rails still. And it takes a lot of stuff for the man to finally get it together. You know if you've played it. But that storyline really hit for me and made me love him as a character. And makes him still my favorite, like, protagonist lore to this day. He's just so well written. I think Edelgard's well written from a antagonistic standpoint, but I feel like to really like Edelgard, you shouldn't play her path first. I cause to this day I haven't done Silver Snow. And I think if they didn't put the Black Eagles path in and just left Silver Snow as the default path, I guess I'm gonna get into spoilers here, but I mean like if you clicked on this video, you know what you're getting into. I think Silver Snow would have been one of the worst received things ever because I don't know anyone who signed up for Black Eagles and just didn't stick with the Black Eagles path, you know? Like, I think if people were forced to do Silver Snow, they probably would have just reset their games and, like, gone Golden Deer. Probably Golden Deer. And they probably would have hated Dimitri, but, like, I, I want to think about what that would have been like if they didn't realize, wait, guys, we need an Edelgard path and how differently the reception would have gone. I I really think about that just because it, it... Silver Snow, I hear no one say good things about ever. I never did it. Funeral of Flowers sounds like a banger. I think it's the second best song, but let's go God Shattering Star. The just absolute peak of... I don't remember it all off the top of my head, but like... Yeah, it's just... <laughs> All I'm saying is Seth was a 4-star, or he was a demote on release when he came into the game for a reason. I'm just saying, folks. But yeah. I don't know. And then Golden Deer. Golden Deer is such a weird path. But there's enough meme lords within Fire Emblem that love it, so I'm like, you know what? Let him have this. It has a really cool, I guess, ending? Ending? Is that the right word? Yeah, I guess the ending's cool. Just like the final chapter of it is really interesting from a Fire Emblem perspective. It's like, hey... It, you know how you kill the first enemy and everything? What if he's the final boss, kind of, sort of, haha? And it's just like... This this would be cool if you play this after multiple Fire Emblems. I feel like playing this as your first Fire Emblem, the Golden Deer Path specifically, you're kind of just like, what the fuck is going on? Because, like, there's just so much stuff they drop in there. Like, there's just casually nukes, and there's casually dubstep. And then you're like, where on earth are we going with this? It doesn't make any sense. But yeah. And then the Blue Lions peak. So I did Black Eagles, Blue Lions, then Golden Deer. That was the order I did them in. Never did Silver Snow, like I've said three times now. And yeah, 
I think the story is really good, but we're 10 minutes in and I haven't really talked about the gameplay or characters. The characters are phenomenal. I want to get that. I want to make that clear that I love the characters in this game. There's a reason they've released all this extra merch after five years and we've got all the stuff. I have... I own the Byleth figure and I did get all the pop-up rates because I'm a figure nut. Obviously, that's just my situation allows me to be able to get them. And if you don't, that's obviously fine. I think you can still get the original pop-up parade stuff on Good Smiles website. So if you are interested, it's worth checking out. Or at least wait for like a Christmas deal or something like that. They always have deals and they seem to show up there. So I was like, okay, cool. Fans can relatively still get the stuff. I think the Byleth is no longer available, even though she was on sale for like ages. But the new stuff looks great. I... Okay, side tangent before I get to the characters. I don't know how I feel with the Dimitri figure. I feel like his face is like not dead enough inside to like really capture his depravity, but it's not menacing enough. You know, it's not angry enough to capture his wrath. I feel like it's just some inconvenienced pretty boy model just trying to make like a scowl and it's not doing it for me. Then again, people didn't like Mark's face on his figure. I still got that because the, everything else about it looks gorgeous. So I'm like, you know what, screw it. I'll get Dimitri too. I just don't do pre-orders because that's a whole... Just don't do pre-orders anymore. You're wasting your money. It always gets discounted. That's a whole other thing. If you're not a figure guy, it doesn't make sense. I'm just saying, if you're a Dimitri fan, you want the Dimitri figure, you can probably afford to hold out and wait until it comes out. Especially with the Yen recovering? Yikes. <laughs> Wallet gonna hurt even more come August, assuming it doesn't get delayed. But yeah. Also, I love the fact that Hilda, Sylvain, and Dorothy are also getting pop-up parades. That's really cool, too, if case you didn't know about that, because they haven't released yet. Also, Byleth, too. Both Byleths, male and female, are getting ones, too, so there's more stuff to look forward to, which is great. But yeah, the characters. The characters are also really good. I think they're the best in Blue Lions, just because they all share in the theme of loss in one way or another. I really love the little trio of, like, Dimitri's friends in the capital. Not counting Dudu, but, like, obviously Dudu's a real one. But I mean, just with, like, Sylvain, Ingrid, and Felix... And that little trio he kind of has with him in the Academy. Ash is a really good boy. And then Mercedes is great. She's kind of like more of a Black Eagles character slapped into the Blue Lions path. But she's still a fantastic character and has her own grief and suffering. Just in a completely different way that unfortunately only gets realized in DLC. Which is very upsetting. <laughs> but overall... The characters are great. Uh, I feel like I'm forgetting someone in the Lions. And it's not going to come to me. Listen, I didn't look up anything before going into this. If I forget, if I forgot your favorite character at some point, uh, don't worry. I forgot about Bernadetta for a bit, even though Bernie Bear is adorable and precious. But yeah. I think just every path has solid characters. Blue Lions has the grief. Black Eagle just has great personalities. I think if you play Black Eagles and you like Edelgard, you probably have like one or two characters you also really like there. Granted, it's probably going to be, like, Petra and Dorothea. Maybe Bernie. It's usually the guys got shafted, but I love Caspar. Caspar's, Caspar's him. I love my little short king going in, messing stuff up. He, he was just so good. Uh, the fact that he shares the same V as Lorenz is pretty funny, but the, the range there is beautiful. Hubert, I mean, it's Robbie Damon. Who's going to complain about Robbie Damon after he nailed a catchy goes to be just like, alright, go all in on the evil. It's like, say less, he's got it on lock. He did great there, and then... Yeah. I think, like, Linhard is good just because... Okay, Linhard, low-key, secret goat, because the man is the only other person besides Lysithia who gets warp. So there's your warp shenanigans. You, like, warp, rescue, do your crap, and then that's how you cheese a lot of stuff. I mean, this is the thing I haven't gotten to yet. Besides the character, I guess I'll talk about Golden Deer. Golden Deer is just, like, best girls, probably. I mean, Marianne's fantastic. Hilda's fantastic. Lysithia, my queen. I stand based. Fucking Dark Spikes. Theta? I don't remember the Greek symbols. But just Dark Spikes. Uh, Death Knight. Get me all the goodies. Pop off queen. Solo everything. I loved... Okay. Side tangent. Did anyone else put Lysithia in a sword base class? Just because... I don't know why she has a secret proficiency in swords, if I remember correctly, she does. But, like, you could just put her in sword. I think her personal skill gave her double EXP, so it was even quicker to go through it. You get her vantage, you link her out, and then you just put her on the side of the map, and just like, alright, queen, pop off. 
Before I get into what I was gonna say, Ash and Wolves, I didn't, I never did a run with any of them, but uh, my favorite is definitely. Actually, I forgot about Yuri. Yuri's really good. I love his personality. We stand up by King, but I don't know. I really like Coco because she, the whole split personality thing. I feel like it's not as forced with her, but then again, I didn't really see her support, so maybe they do overextend it. But like. It got annoying in the Ashen Wolves path, but it also was kind of endearing just because of the sheer difference of, like, despair to just the raw, to have the, the, the oh, 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 Joe Sama laugh energy she has. I really liked Happy too, though, and both this was chill. It's like, alright, you know what, I can have a couple pints with this guy. But, okay, get into what I was saying, gameplay. <laughs> 16 minutes in, I still haven't talked about gameplay. And coming from me, that's a... Uh... You know, it means I don't like to talk about it. The gameplay in Three Houses, it's its obviously... It's customizable as shit. Too much so, to a degree. I just want to say this. I don't know what the name of his class is. is it's Barbarossa. Did I just remember that? Did I pull that out of my ass? I don't know. Comments will correct me on that one. That's either his, like, Tier 2 or Tier 3. I forget which, but Barbarossa is a class Claude gets. That's probably one of my favorite classes in Fire Emblem, because I'm a flyer simp, so uh, I love flyers whenever they show up in most games. There's a few I don't like, but for the most part, you've got a character who has a mount with wings. I'm a sucker for him. I'm in. Chloe, my queen, and engage. Pop off further with Sigurd Lance and Flame Lance just nuking everything. Just, oh, so good. Anyways, uh, but it's really sad because the default strategy in Three Houses almost takes, it really does take away a lot of the replayability because you're like, cool, I want to customize everyone. It's like, oh, wait, if you're a magic user who isn't Lysithia or Linhard for warp strats, you're kind of just irrelevant. You, you also want, like, Mercedes as well for her healing because I think her and Flayne, if I remember correctly, are the only users of Fortify, so they have that use going for them. But, like, beyond those four magic users... If you have an inclination of magic, it's just not worth using you. At least as a mage. You keep Dorothea for a dancer, and then you decide if you want to make Hilda pop ass, so I can put the meme here now, I guess. I like cash in my head to my ass. Or you give it to Marianne, because she could be a good, uh... With her blue gang sword, it works pretty well with the versatility of needing magic and having some pinch healing, but... Yeah, the best dancer is it's like Dorothea for... It's just Dorothea, just recruit Dorothea in every path, you can do it. She's pretty easy, because I think she just needs charm to get, so it's just, there's your dancer. They knew what they were doing. But, yeah, the gameplay is really, really limiting because of how accessible it is. It's almost like, it's like the Syndrome meme, where it's like, if everyone's super, no one is. So, like, since everyone can just get on a mount and just start blasting with arrows from above, it doesn't become that impressive when Claude has his special skill that, like, gives him essentially ether with his, uh, what are they called, relic? Relic weapons? I don't remember, but you know what I'm talking about if you've played the path. Because everyone's best class is just going into a, a wyvern and mess fucking shit up. And then, so it's like a lot of the final tier classes are just not worth it. Dark magic is lame. Like, men as magic users just suck because the male sorcerer class is just so much worse than the gremory class. And even then, the females don't have it that great because they mostly want to be healers. I mean, Mercedes and Flayne are really the only one you go for. If you're insane, you can try to make Hilda's bolting work, but like, eh. They did make it a little bit better with the Dark Flyer class with the DLC. And then Happy's, uh, whatever her mounted class is, I think is also available. So that one's a little bit better, but the, the gameplay just... The maps were not great. I don't remember a single map that was good, aside from like the final maps. And that's more so because Apex of the World is blasting in my mind as I picture the Black Eagles and Blue Lions Final Pass. I did like the, the last two maps of Edelgard Path were really good because like you felt the finality of it all. But you're like, why are we here already? And then yeah, Go God Shattering Star playing in uh, Golden Deer Final Map is really good. I'd probably like Funeral of Flowers blasting for the uh, White. I don't remember the path already. Silver Snow Path. But a lot of the gameplay doesn't stick out to me. It really is the character and the story carrying this, which almost feels like an inverse of Awakening when that was still going off. So you have 
the gameplay being really good, but just it's overpowered and break game breaking. Whereas this game just has really solid story keeping you through the monotony. Because like after a while, you get bored of the monastery. I think the worst thing about Three Houses is that people say it is replayable. I really feel like it isn't. Like after the first time you go through the monastery and you realize you have to go through it all again pre-time skip to get to the juicy part of the new content, you're like, ooh, I, I, ooh, this is starting to drag. Even as you skip everything, it takes like a good amount of time to go through all the maps. Because if you want to be optimal, then you got to put in the time to get everything. But if you don't do it and you just kind of rush through it, you're just kind of like, oh, some of my units are lacking. And then you start to fall back on those strategies of just like Lysithia nuke everything, everyone get on a flyer, call it a day. And I think that's the issue with this game. The developers, I think, I forget where this was said, but I remember hearing it somewhere, said that they wanted to like have people like play this game like over several like years essentially. They're like, all right, you do one path, put it down, come back to do another path. And it's like, that's just not how gamers work. We're not doing that shit. We, were, we grew up on Netflix, well y'all did, I didn't, I was too broke for that shit. To be able to, what's the word, just like go to something and then do like a slightly different version, especially if you did Black, if you didn't do Black Eagles. Only with like Black Eagles do you have an actually unique experience compared to the other paths. Like playing Blue Lions, while the story is completely different to Golden Deer, the amount of, whatchamacallit, just like content that gets recycled does start to wear on you a bit. There are enough differences, I think, between Blue Lions and Golden Deer, if only towards the end, because you have, like, two different maps, two vastly different maps. I think three? Like, for a while, you're just like, wow, this is just the same shit, different context. Whereas, the third time you do it with, like, Silver Snow or whichever path you didn't do, you're like, ooh, I'm, I'm tapped out. I'm like, I'm good. But if you didn't do Blue Lions, I don't know what's wrong with you. Do Blue Lions, trust me, you'll love it. But that is seriously just, like, why I don't mess with the replayability of it. I haven't gone back to it. That said, I could probably play uh, Three Hopes. I've not touched that, really. Tell me how that is in the comments. I think I'll end it here because I'm going off for too long. But, yeah. Overall, thoughts on this are I think it's a good story. I don't know where we go from here, though. I don't know where we top it. I didn't mention Engage once. I'll just say quickly I love Engage. A lot of people don't vibe with it, though, so that's a bit upsetting. But I I really, really wish there was more... What's the word? I guess the actual replayability beyond what I just said. And maybe I'm just doing it wrong. Tell me in the comments below your thoughts, though. I don't really have a good way to close this. I just really hope that the next Fire Emblem game dials it back on just having a home base. That's what the Monastery and the, the Somniel have taught me from Engage. Just... Just do it like Radiant Dawn. Just keep it simple, please. All right. Thank you all for listening. If you heard my rambling on for this long, I'm just stopping here to make the editing easier on me. And let me know what you guys hope for in the next Fire Emblem game. I'd love to hear you guys' thoughts, and I'll try to read everything I can as it comes in. Thank you all for listening. I'm going to get up out of here. Peace.